This video is supposed to go with a set of notes that I posted about something called window functions. And uh, window functions, I think, for this offering of the course might be as high up into advanced SQL as we get. And um, maybe it's intimidating to think of it as advanced SQL or something, given that you've probably already had enough of a hard time with non-advanced SQL. Uh, I, I think window functions um, are a bit of an acquired taste, but only because of the weird... 70s COBOL or whatever, like ancient language style syntax that, that SQL uses. What's weird about window functions, I've complained before about how SQL syntax contains a lot of these features that apparently when SQL was designed were common in a lot of languages. I occasionally blame COBOL for that, but it's not just COBOL, um, that uh, we don't see that much anymore. So things like the funny ordering of the inner join and then the on clause the strange sort of quasi-English style phrasing, you know, saying group by as opposed to just group or something similar, not using brackets as much. Um, it's interesting because window functions, what we're going to talk about here, are relatively new. They're a development of the last uh, 10 or 15 years in SQL, and yet they use some of the most impenetrable 70s style syntax that I've seen in SQL. However, if you ignore that, if you work around um, the syntax, they're actually pretty useful and, and many people will find them to be more intuitive once they get used to them than um, uh, having to do things the old-fashioned way. So just for a reminder on what the old-fashioned way looks like, uh, we have this query that we made up in some previous uh, video that you probably hopefully watched by now. And the point of this query is I would like to, for every item in every order, so there's order number 1001 and it has a line in it, I want to know whether that particular item, the cost of that item is above or below the average price of an item in that order. And if you remember at the time that we developed this, the difficulty, um, it wasn't deciding if a number was a was uh, below or above the average. The difficulty was getting a row into a state where you have both the number of the order, the product, a particular product like a peach or something, but you also know at the same time inside of one row you know both the order number, the product you're looking at, but also the average price of the whole order. It's hard to get both local and global information in one table. And the reason is, although you can compute the average price of an order, so this, in fact, we can, we can just extract this and take a look at it. This query right here computes the average price of a single order. Uh, and there you go. We, we, take the, we get the order number and the average price of the order. The problem is, if we do the averaging, we've aggregated. And so you can no longer, once you've computed this average, in the same query, you can no longer look at the individual elements of the order. So the way we worked around that in the lecture where this was derived was we first made a subquery that maps each order number to the average price of a product in that order. We then have to basically join the subquery back to the order contents table to get what we want. Uh, and that's, that's uh, tedious and um, it's not the worst thing in the world. I mean, it's only a few more lines of code. And as you know, in any language, there are going to be these things that take a bit longer. Uh, but it's the kind of thing that can really twist your brain in a pretzel when you try to design these queries because you have to decide when do I need to do this weird create a subquery and join it back together thing. Uh, and then there's this, which we came up with. This is a, a classic example of that, what I was just complaining about, the strange COBOL-style word in case when, as opposed to just you know using something like what if statements in C or Java would, would use. Um, this, it turns out, wasn't the hard part of that query. But just to prove the point, let's, let's look at this stripped-down version of the same query. Uh, and this is a, one of the intermediate steps that we had before we got the query above when we originally derived it. So I have the so what I've done here is I've computed the average price of each order, and then I've selected the uh, order number, the, the name of a product, the price of that particular product. So here's the price of a peach, um, and then the average price of the order is now in every row. So every row for order 1001 has the average price of order 1001. Notice that. For this row, and this one, and this one, I am doing aggregation. I want the result of aggregation for that particular order. The average price column is supposed to contain the price for that particular order. So there is still a similarity between this piece of data and this order number, and arguably this, because it contributed to that piece of data. The problem is, I'm not allowed to do aggregation at, at the same time as keeping the individual items. I have to do aggregation, which collapses every single um, order into one row, which is the average price, and then I have to fold it back in to my original order contents table. And so it turns out SQL has this feature, uh, this broad category of things called window functions. 
uh, which we'll see in a minute, the actual, the term window doesn't apply to most of it, but uh, it, it's a syntactic extension called window functions. And if you want to learn about them, I've posted some notes and the notes, the very first thing in the notes is a link to this secondary textbook we've been using all semester. Some of you hopefully have seen it by now. It's free. You can get a copy off, off through the library for free. Um, this book by Claire Churcher called Beginning SQL Queries, which describes window functions. And it turns out our, the big book, the, um, the, the complete book about database systems uh, by Garcia Molina and the other authors doesn't actually cover window functions, I think because it's too old. The, the window functions are new enough in SQL that they didn't really exist or they weren't standardized by the time that the other book came out. So between the notes I posted, hopefully between this video, the notes I posted and uh, that other book, there are lots of resources on these. We'll see that to a large extent, window functions are syntactic sugar which is to say that you can get away with just doing this. You don't necessarily always need window functions to do things like this query here. Um, there is one feature, well, okay, we'll see that it's, it's sort of two facets of the same thing, but there is one aspect you cannot achieve without window functions, and that's this idea of ranking products, or sorry, ranking things inside of a group. The query we're gonna do in a minute is, I might wanna ask the question of, okay, order 1001 contains three products. Which is the most expensive? Which is the second most expensive? Which is the third most expensive? I want to compute a ranking inside a group. Anytime you need to do that, or something derived from that, you basically need window functions. You can't do that with standard aggregation without making an enormous mess, uh, or without using something equally as tedious like uh, recursive SQL statements. So let's take a look at this. So this video, I'm mostly going to be scrolling through existing queries. And to be clear, these are actually the queries that are in the notes that I've posted. Um, because this, this is a case where the amount of extra typing needed wouldn't really, you'd get no value added by watching me type this in on the video. So here, I am doing aggregation. And the first thing you might notice is that there is no group by. I, I'm running one select statement, no nested queries. There is no group by. Uh, clause. And I'll run the query. And you can see the output is exactly the same uh, as the output from the previous query. So I select order number. I'm selecting from the, the join of order contents and tables. Order number, name, price per kilogram. And then this thing. So you notice that I, this is an aggregation function we've already used. Average of price per kilogram. Up here, when I do aggregation with group by, I use average price per kilogram. And I want to extract part of this again to just show off exactly like how significant it is that I have no group by and everything still works. So let's run this query, but let's omit the group by clause. Um, so you can see here, uh, well, a couple of things. One, if I literally do not have uh, the, the group by clause, then Postgres complains. Now, what it's complaining about isn't actually um, the aggregation function. It's complaining that, hey, you, you, you've done aggregation. There's the average function. You've done aggregation, but you're trying to use a column that wasn't involved in aggregation. And we know that that's an error. So we'll delete this. What if I try just selecting an aggregation function result? And as we know, if you perform aggregation with no grouping, you do get a result. It's assumed that your group is just all of the rows. So if I just use the aggregation function with no group by clause normally, I get one row and one column in my result, which is just the average of the price of everything in the order contents table. So this query down here doesn't do that. I still have no group by clause. And if I run it, I still get that nice table of all of the order contents plus this extra column. So what I've done is sort of pocket aggregation without the heavyweight step of having to make a separate table and then join it back in. Really what I want is I just want one extra column added to my order contents table whose data is derived from grouping on the order contents table. And so this clause here, which is the over clause, which I'm allowed to provide after any aggregation function. This is already, we've seen this being used before. It's an aggregation function. So it's count, so is min, so is max, so is sum. Um, if I use an aggregation function, I then provide an over clause. And we'll see over can have lots of different things inside of it. But here I'm saying partition by order num. Now, what that actually partition here means group. Um, 
it's a, just like this weird issue with with and having, uh, uh, or sorry, the where clause and the having clause uh, in SQL. They just love adding new names for everything. So partition by order num restricts the use of the aggregation function. So we're no longer doing classic, the gamma operator style aggregation in SQL. Instead, I'm selecting individual items from the order contents table. And then I am going and computing this value for every row. And when I use the over clause and I say partition by order num, what this is saying, and I'm just gonna, for the sake of um, illustrating, again, for lack of a board, I have to improvise a bit here. Select order num, name, price per kilogram from order contents, natural join products. So I run this, and what I'm looking at before I've hit this point, before I get to this line, is I have a row which is an order number, a name, and a price per kilogram. And I want to add in extra information based on what's already in this row. So I say, okay, I want to compute the average price per kilogram over the following set of rows. So the average price that I want, just again to compare these two queries, the average price I want attached to these three rows is the average for this order, order 1001. So when I'm here and I'm looking, I only have the first three columns, and I say I would like in these three rows there to be one extra column called average price, and I want it to contain the average price per kilogram over this group of rows. All of the rows for this order. Okay, wait, what's this order? Well, presumably it's all of the rows whose order number value is the same as the row I'm working on. So if I'm working on the row for peach, the average I want to compute is the average of the price per kilogram across all rows whose order number matches the one in this row, so order 1001. So when I use partition by in the, in the over clause of my, um, after my aggregation function, what I'm telling the database to do is to go find all of the rows whose order number matches the current row, and then make a group of those rows, compute the average requested, and then, and then stick it right back where I started. So don't perform the full table aggregation that we're used to. Instead, go off in, uh, somewhere else, compute one value, and then send it back. Um, and so I would like to think of this sort of like pocket aggregation. We get all the benefits of aggregation, but for this use case where otherwise we'd have to make a full table and then join it back, we can instead just send the database off to compute something on the side and then it computes it. So if I stick the over clause after an aggregation function, um, then the aggregation doesn't collapse rows like I would normally um, expect it to. Uh, and so the comment says that. Um, if I generalize this, so we're going to see in a minute, the over clause actually has lots of different options. There's partition by, there's order by, there's this strange directive called rows between, which it turns out is the windowing that windowing functions are named after. But I want to talk a bit about um, what it means to put a partition statement in the over clause. And it turns out it's exactly the same as the presence or absence of group by in a sense. Um, so we remember if I don't have a group by clause in my query, then uh, the group is assumed to be every row in the table. Here, I have a, I'm using the count aggregation function. I'm looking at the order contents table, and I am selecting order number and count star. Now, I'm not actually grouping at all. I, I'm just saying, and I'm not, I'm not using anything in my over clause. I'm not partitioning, nor am I grouping. And every single order number gets selected with a total item count of nine. And the reason is because there are nine rows in the table. And what I'm telling the count aggregation function to do here is I'm saying, okay, here's which rows I want you to count. Go find me all the rows that, oh, that's it, just all the rows, and then count them. Think about up here, I said, go and average the price among all rows whose order number matches my order number, the order number of the current row. But here, the over clause is empty, so it just, uh, accounts every single row. The aggregation function is applied to every single row. Probably what I wanted here was something like, uh, if I'm using order number, maybe what I want is to count the number of items in each order. So I could do that with this. And we'll see that this is actually not as useful um, an application of the over clause as the previous one. This might be a better place to use traditional uh, aggregation. So we'll run this. Um, and so we see order number 1000. So the order number value of the current row is 1,000. Partition the rows of the table to find all the ones whose order number equals 1,000 and then count those and then stick the result back here. Same with this row, same with this row. But wait a minute, there's order 1,001 twice. What's happening? Well, 
what I've done is I've just looped through the rows of the order contents table, and for each one I've said go find all the rows with the same order number and then count the number of elements. And so I don't get the thing I sort of expect, which is if I want the number of items in each order, I don't want to see each order three times or, you know, the same number of times as the number of items. I want what traditional aggregation gives me. I want it to collapse the rows together. Uh, and that's not happening here. Uh, and so that's one thing is this pocket aggregation. It is not giving you the collapsing of rows that you might expect from other aggregation. That can be useful in some cases. It can maybe not be useful in others. It's true, though, that um, although I don't know if this is the best way of solving this problem, it's true that if you use select distinct here, you'd actually get exactly the same result as you would with a query like select order num. Sorry, I'll... And then I would say something like from order contents. And then the way we would have written this query before this lecture is I would group by order number. And then I guess I have to order by order number. And if I run that, I get exactly the same result. Um, I would say this is a better query for the particular task I'm doing here because this, I'm using pocket aggregation and then I'm undoing the benefit of it. On the other hand, Maybe if you look at this one, you'd agree this is probably a great deal easier to think about than something like this, where you need a nested query. Not only do you need a nested query, you have to figure out exactly how do you fold it back in when you're done. So we have the option uh, of using this pocket aggregation to do all sorts of neat stuff that, that we otherwise would have difficulty with. Um, but the reason that we, that we like it is because it actually enables a bit of extra behavior. So up to this point, we've just seen clever ways of using the over clause to achieve results maybe faster or less, um, in a less complicated way uh, than we otherwise would. But what we want is a, a few extra features. I want to be able to ask questions about rows where I don't, where the grouping that I want to do isn't necessarily based on some specific column. It's based on where a row is in the table. I want to be able to ask questions like, for every order, tell me whether this order costs more than the average price of all of the orders before it. If you think about that, what groups am I talking about there? Well, really, every order gets its own little group. So for order 1001, I'm asking, is this more expensive than every order before it? So I guess that's just order 1000. For order 1002, I'd be asking, is this more expensive than every order before it? Well, that's two things. So each row has its own little set of criteria. And it turns out traditional aggregation is not helpful for that. And it usually requires things like cross joins, which, which can really uh, complicate things uh, quickly. So. With window functions, or, or sorry, with the over clause, it turns out the over clause is a symptom of something called a window function. I'm giving it away here. Um, when you're using the over clause, you have access to a new aggregation function called rank. And you can prove this to yourself, but rank doesn't work if you just use group by. You are not allowed to use rank unless there is an over clause after it, because rank makes no sense outside of the context provided by the over clause. You'll also notice that in this over clause, I have included the order by directive which normally we don't associate with aggregation. So I'm going to run it and we'll take a look at what we get. Um, it turns out that this is actually, we did produce this result. This is a, a result we've already seen uh, repeatedly, in fact, in disguise, which is a variant of the question, find all the products that are more or less expensive than each thing. And we've seen how to solve that with an ugly set of nested queries and unions. We've seen how to solve it with an outer join, an aggregation. And now we can solve it in four lines using this interesting rank aggregation function. So what does the rank function do? Um, what I want to ask here is, for each product, tell me whether it's the most expensive or least expensive or the second least expensive or the third least expensive product. I want to know the product's ranking among all of its peers, among all of the other products. So in terms of the current row, if I'm looking at, let's say, this row here, what I want to find out is if I take the price per kilogram and I put the prices of all the products in order, where would peach be in that ordering? Would it be first? Would it be second? Would it be third? So I want its rank according to some set of criteria. Now think about this. It's not just a function of the columns that we compare. It's a function of how we compare them. So it is really a matter of sort the rows into an order and tell me where peach would be in that order. And that's why the order by uh, directive appears inside my over clause. So if I read the query, what I'm saying is select the name and the price of all the products as well as the rank of that product computed based on this criteria. So over the set of rows defined by ranking all the products by price per kilogram. 
There's no partition by directive here, so it says use all the rows. Take every row on the table, order them by price per kilogram, and then give me the rank of the current product in that ordering. And we'll call that price rank. And you'll notice that the way it's defined, it, it, the order by directive puts rows in ascending order by default, which means that the lowest number is first. So the rank of pineapple is one, the pineapple is the cheapest product. The rank of raspberry, the most expensive product, is six. So that's the rank aggregation function that we would otherwise not be allowed to use if we didn't use the over clause. Now, for the sake of completion, um, we might observe that maybe this isn't how we would normally define rank. If a product is first or second, maybe we expect that to be the most expensive or the second most expensive product. So I have that option as well. I am allowed to stick the word, just like with the order by clause in SQL, I can stick the word descending at the end to, or, to put, place things in the opposite order instead of, and, or explicitly I could say ascending instead of just leaving it like this. Um, I might also want to determine ranks in terms of discrete groupings. So here, I'm ranking each product compared to all of the other products. I just say, select rows from the products table, compute the rank over all other rows under this ordering. What if instead I want to compute the rank inside of a specific order? So I'll run the query and we can take it apart. So here's order 1001 in my result. It's got the three products that we expect. The most expensive one is a peach. The least expensive one is a pear. Notice that it says the rank of peach is one. It's the most expensive. The rank of lime is two. The rank of pear is three. If we look at order 1003, uh, same story. Um, because of, so I guess incidentally, it turns out that the, the table is sorted in, in order by that. Let's try and defeat that for the sake of proving our point. Okay, so um, if I look here in order 1001, notice how the results came out in an arbitrary order, but still, it's true that peach was the third most expensive item, pear, sorry, was the third most expensive item in order 1001. And here, raspberry was the first most expensive, the most expensive item in order 1003. So how did I do that? Well, I, I go to order contents join products as usual to, to work with both things. Then I select the order number, the name of the product, the price of the product, and the rank of this row over the following definition. First, break the rows up and only include rows that whose order number matches the current row's order number. So if I'm sitting here, Find all the rows whose order number matches 1,003. Now, sort those rows by price per kilogram in descending order. So the most expensive thing would come first. And then tell me where the current row falls in that ordering. And the row for peach would be second. It would be the second most expensive thing. So the rank is two. So I can't compute ranks. We've seen that there are clever tricks we could do with joins and things to allow us to achieve ranking. Um, without having to use this aggregation function. But they're clunky and they might be slow uh, and uh, certainly we can't use the rank function to do it. We have to do it some other way. This, if we don't, once we have the over clause, we can use rank directly to compute that. And that's one reason why I had to front load all the challenging queries about computing ranks before we'd covered it so that we could use them as an excuse to learn about outer joins and aggregation and things. Um, but the reason ultimately that we care about this isn't even the rank function. It is correlated to this ability to take a group of rows and determine some internal ordering of those rows. But it's not just, is this row first, second, or third in the ordering? I want to be able to ask questions about a row relative to other rows next to it or nearby to it in the ordering. Uh, but we'll, we'll explore this a little bit more here. So, um, oh, whoops. So here's a query from earlier. We uh, there's no fancy pocket aggregation happening here. What I'm doing is I'm selecting the total price of every order, and I've chosen to sort the orders by their um, order date. And you might notice uh, that for some reason, the order dates aren't already ordered by order number. And this is because, and this is explicit here, you can't assume that just because an order number, just because you know one order has number 1007 and the other order has number seven, doesn't mean order seven came first. The reason we have an order date column is to understand that ordering. And so it turns out that order number 1003 was somehow placed before order number 1000. Who knows why that was? In any case, we have to live with that. So we, I've decided to sort uh, my list of orders by date. So they're, they're now in chronological order. Now all of this is independent of window functions. It is defining an application that we might actually need something more advanced than aggregation, more advanced than ranking, but related to ranking, um, that we can't achieve with any other SQL. 
So uh, I compute the price of each order. We've already done that over and over again. It's this, I've put it in a nested query just so we can call it order prices. Then I join the order table to that and I order by order date. Here's the kind of question I want to ask. For each particular order, let's pick order 1001, it chronologically falls somewhere in this sequence. We don't know exactly where. There could be millions of orders. We don't know what their, what their ultimate um, arrangement is if we sort them by date. But I do know that if I'm looking at order 1001, there were probably some orders that came before it and some orders that came after it. I wanna be able to ask questions like, um, is order 1001 more expensive than the average price of all of the orders that chronologically came earlier? Is order 1001 less expensive than the order that came right before it chronologically? So not the one with the order number one less than it, but the order that came before it chronologically. Keeping in mind that here, for example, order 1001 was placed right after order 1000. But maybe later I go back and add an order, 9999, that happened between these two things. I want to ask the question, chronologically or relative to any particular ordering, whether it be date or anything else, I want to ask the question, is this order cheaper or more expensive, or is the customer the same customer or a different customer than placed the previous order? Or did this customer place any of the previous five orders? So what I want to do is sort the list of orders, or in general, sort my data according to some criteria, and then perform some data analysis where each row uh, includes information based on the five previous rows or the 10 previous rows or the 10 next rows or every row up to the current row. So basically a window of different rows around the current one. So I could say, for example, is row 1001, is its price, let's say, bigger or smaller than the average of the two orders before and the two orders after it. So is it part, and, and you think about that, that's a window of two orders in each direction that moves along as you keep going. So it turns out that this concept of window functions refers to that ability. And it's one of these extra clauses we can add in the over clause to say, apply the aggregation function not just only to, to, to rows that meet certain criteria in terms of their column values, like order number equals the same thing, but also rows that are within a certain distance of the current row in the ordering. And the syntax is gonna be, it's gonna be quite a thing. Um, so I will take this over clause apart for your benefit here. You'll split it into multiple lines. So I want to compute for this query. I would like to compute, actually I can just run it. Um, I have each order and they're already sorted by date. I can even select order date here just to make it very clear that's what's happening. Uh, and in fact, for clarity, just because I wanted to make it absolutely clear that the sorting isn't already being done for me. So um, I ordered this by date. Here are my list of order numbers ordered by date. And we notice this was the first order. Here is what I want. I would like to know whether each order is less expensive or more expensive than the one that was placed chronologically before it, the single one order placed before it. So what I'll do is I will have an extra column called previous price. Here's the price of this order. Here's the price of the previous one. Now it makes sense for the very first order ever, that ever received. I don't have a previous price. It's null. That makes sense. Um, order number two, the previous price was 69.4 because that was the price of the order before. The order number 1002 here, um, the previous price was 67.25. So what I want basically is for each order, this is order 1002, I want to take all of the other rows, sort them chronologically, and find the single one row preceding the current row, and then copy in its total price value. So here's how I will do that. First, I have to use an aggregation function to achieve this. It's true that for each order, I'm only looking for one thing, but I still have to use some aggregation function. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll catch on to the fact that the max function if I'm only taking the max of one thing, it'll always give me back the same one thing. So I'll use the max function to get away with this. You can prove to yourself that the min function would also work because you're only aggregating one item. You could even use sum in this case. Um, but max works pretty well because it, the, the max of zero things is null, which is nice. Um, so I take the maximum total price, which is this entry, um, the, sorry, the entry of this column here, over, I order all of my other rows by order date, and then the aggregation only applies to the rows between the single row before, I start at the row one before the current row and I end at the row one before the current row. 
So I know this is this is real ugly. This is probably the worst 70s style syntax we've seen in the whole course. And I think that we will see for the whole course. Well, until we get to not select statements, but things like database triggers. But um, this is pretty hideous to my mind. And uh, unfortunately, it appears to be an invention of about like 2005 or something. So people, I don't know, people really wanted to get into the spirit of writing SQL uh, style syntax back then, they, but they should have known better. So um, what this says is, in your over clause for your pocket aggregation, first you have to define some ordering, and then you choose all of the rows that meet your ordering and partitioning criteria that are within a certain range from the current one. So one preceding, you could also say look back by two, you could, or you know, look back by five preceding rows. And the other endpoint of your range can be one preceding, it could be current row, it could be one following, which is the row right after the current row, and it can even be unbounded following. That is every row after the current row. So the end of the range is just the end of the table. And you're also allowed to use the word unbounded preceding. Uh, and again, there's, there's a lot of, I, I have a lot of issues with that. But what I'm really defining here is rows between start point and end point. In this case, my start point and my end point are the same thing. I want one row, for every, every row from one row before me to one row before me, and that's it. And then take the maximum of that single value, and that's the previous price. So you probably heard that. Um, okay, well, I've, I've mangled this. You've probably heard you've probably heard most of that explanation and you're staring at this saying, how am I supposed to cope? Like, what, what am I supposed to do to actually make any of this work? Um, and so there's a few options. One, uh, the book contains a lot of other examples and it can go into more detail than we can because we it has a lot more of these custom built databases that do that. Um, and so we, maybe you can see if examples from a few different angles. In the next Applied SQL lecture, I'm going to talk about using window functions at greater detail because maybe what would help is seeing me write them as opposed to just watching me press uh, execute on queries that I've already written. Um, what I've do, done in this query is, this is the previous query that we just wrote. I want to select all orders whose price is less than the order placed before them. So I have to, I, I have to um, filter the result. Now it turns out that in this example up here, I'm not allowed to use this result in my WHERE clause because of course this doesn't get done until after the WHERE clause is evaluated. So if I want to filter this table, I have to filter it uh, after making it a nested query. So first I make a nested query uh, and then just so like just to be clear about this, if I delete the WHERE clause, I get the same table I had before. And then I add a WHERE clause to say I only want the rows whose total price is less than the price of the order before them. And you can see the only order that meets that criteria is order number 1000. And so we have this. Uh, and so the idea behind windowing, which is specifying a range of rows, is to allow you not only to refer to a group, but to refer to your row's position inside the group. And we can see why maybe in traditional aggregation that wouldn't make any sense, because there's no idea of the current row in traditional aggregation. In regular aggregation, there's just the group. We boil the whole group down to a single row at the end. There's no idea that once we've grouped things, individual rows even continue to exist. With this pocket aggregation, there is still this idea of the identity of an individual row, and then we can compute things based on that. Um, and so here's an example of using a different style, like a different window definition. Uh, and so I'm going to also justify this just to, or sorry, I'm going to indent it. I'm, I guess I'll justify it as well conceptually. Um, so first I want to make it so that the editor will show you the whole thing. Okay, so I'm going to run this. Um, and you'll notice every now and then dBeaver throws me an, an irritating error. If you're using dBeaver, keep in mind that sometimes when it gives you errors, the errors, as I mentioned in an earlier video, are the result of funny spacing problems. So for example, that's the same query as it was before, but dBeaver couldn't figure out what I meant, so it gave me a dumb error. So just keep that in mind. Don't panic if that happens. Um, so I'm back to the table that uh, I had before, except, so I have one row for each order, and I'll even, um, maybe we should even fold in the order date just to make it absolutely clear, um, and then put that semicolon back. Actually, it will order by order date. So I've got my orders, I have my order date. Here's what I wanna know. Um, for each order, I wanna know the price of the order. Okay, I have that. I also want to know the average price of every previous order, every order that occurred before that order in time. 
Um, and actually, I want to show something else quickly. Just to make it absolutely clear here, the result of the average price column doesn't have anything to do with the order that my results are displayed. So here, my orders have been sorted by order number again, so they're not in chronological order. That doesn't affect what happened in the aggregation. Um, the reason I've been displaying it sorted by order date is just to make it clear what's going on. It has no real effect on what data is being computed. The order by clause in the outside query isn't even evaluated until all the numbers are already there. So I want for each order the cost of that order and the average price of every order before that order, not including that order. Um, and so the way I do that is I say what I want, therefore, is like the order number, the date, the price, and the result of applying the average function to the price of the following rows. Take every row, sort them by order date. And now the row I'm looking at, let's say row 1001, it's third in the list. Now take every row between the, the first one, so unbounded preceding is weird SQL speak for the very first row in the ordering, and one preceding, which is one preceding the current row. So that's this row here, row, the, the row that says order 1000. Um, and so take all of those rows, every row between the beginning of the ordering by date and one before the current row, and then average their total price. And um, and we can see for order 1002, same story. So take all of the rows between unbounded preceding, means the very first thing in the order, so that's 69.4, and one row above the current row, that's 67.25. And then apply the average function to the total price column of all of those things. Uh, so that, okay, I'll run that again. But um, I, I want to show a few variations of this. So suppose I want the average to be the average of every order up to and including the current order. In that case, I would say, well, average every row between unbounded preceding and the current row. And we can see that, that, that means that one preceding means stop one above the current row. Current row means stop at and including the current row. This range is an inclusive range, the one we specify in rows between. So here the average, so for order 1003, the total price is 69. The average of all previous orders is 69.4. There's only been one order, and it's this one. Um, order number 1,000, the average is now the average of 69 plus 3, so, which is 72 or so, and so that's 36. Uh, and then the average uh, with order 1,001 is that plus 67, um, the average of those three things. And then down here, it's the average of all four things. So this is, again, I I, I'm so sorry that we have to learn how to use this weird phrasing, one preceding and five following or current row or whatever. Um, but uh, ultimately, all it's doing is defining some subrange of rows. So I think what I'm going to do is just for the sake of I want to use the other option at least once. Um, let's see. Hold on a sec. Okay, we'll keep this one the way it is. Um, I want to have this be one preceding again. So th the query calls this the average previous price. So I want to make sure I'm being faithful to that. But I want to add one more query here to sort of do the opposite. So it's worth noting that there's no real significance to the preceding keyword. I, I am allowed to do something like this. I want, in this version of the query, for every order, I want to compute the average price of all of the orders placed after it. So that would be, so for order, 1000, for order number 1000, I want the average price of every order, starting with the one appearing one after the current row, and ending wherever the table ends, as far in the future as you want. So I'm going to start with the one row following mine, and go f all the way into the future, unbounded following. And we can see that, let's take a look at order number 1001. The average price of all the rows in the future is 220, because there's only one row in the future. This is the very last order, so the average price is null because there isn't anything after it. The average price of order 1,000 is uh, 143, which I maybe take my word for it, is the average of 67.25 and 220. And just like before, I would be allowed to say to include the current row in the future price by using current row instead of one preceding. Uh, and so you can see here, we've got now the average future price includes that thing. So again, I, as I said at the beginning, window functions, I actually don't, I think they're pretty non-threatening. I think that the syntax that's been defined for them is just so bizarre that it scares people off. E even I took quite a while to warm to using window functions for things. Now that I know them, they're great because I can use them for a lot of the pocket aggregation stuff that I don't really need the window functions for. But when you get to things where you need this rows between directive, um, even if you can do ranking without 
using the over clause. Doing this sort of operation without the over clause is pretty painful because you have to do, in order to do it, you basically have to do ranking manually and then do a bunch of other stuff. And although it's possible, it ends up creating queries that are pages long and give the database server a headache, not as well as the database programmer, I guess. So in the next Applied SQL lecture, we will talk about um, both using all the interesting joins that we've just learned, as well as uh, various ways of using window functions. And hopefully that, that makes it a little bit more palatable for everybody.